Go. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Dumelang. Welcome to our last webinar in a series of six webinars that has been hosted over the last few weeks between the University of Northwest and Namibia University of Science and Technology. For those of you who have been able to join us on the journey from the very first uh, webinar, I'm sure that you really had an engaged and uh, interesting time throughout this series. When we first conceptualized this project, the two universities were trying to explore how not only we could connect between uh, different countries in terms of finding ways to generate conversations around how the human and social sciences can best respond to the COVID pandemic, but also how we can foster relationships between scholars, communities, and among other things, um, ourselves as academics. It became clear through this journey that uh, we could learn a lot more about the human and social sciences, especially in terms of how do we respond in a meaningful way to challenges that affect not only our scholarship, but our communities. The COVID-19 pandemic has given the world a very interesting, but sometimes I would say painful series of lessons that have been learned. Among other things, we've learned that our science has not been able to anticipate the magnitude of this pandemic. As a result, many countries are still racing to find a cure in terms of a vaccine. And there are other issues that have come to fall in terms of how the pandemic affects people, how it affects our, our bodies physiologically, how it will affect our economies in the long term. In this webinar series, we've been able to focus on issues such as how we generate knowledge in terms of the historical origins of what we know, how we know it, and therefore the whole discussion around the archive. We've also been able to look at other issues such as the, the subject of intellectual property, how we begin to apportion ownership or rights for those who are knowledge generators or those who take part in the production of knowledge. We've looked at other subjects such as the issue of language. We noted how there's a deficit in terms of languages that are able to, I would say, take advantage of this COVID-induced space and generate the kinds of knowledge and uh, responses that communities can harness. Among other things, we've also looked at the subject of therapeutics. What are the kinds of treatments that are available to communities and also, of course, to individuals whether they are affected or they are infected. And in the last webinar, we looked at the subject of gender and community support, looking at how the interplay between gender and the pandemic in this instance has played out, especially in terms of our bodies, how it has affected women and children in particular under the lockdown periods. And we've come to the conclusion that there are many areas of interest in terms of research, engagement, and scholarship that we can pursue. It is my pleasure, on behalf of uh, the University of Northwest and on behalf of NAST, and especially with sincere acknowledgments of the vice chancellors of the two institutions, Professor Dan Kwadi, who has been part of this journey on behalf of Northwest University, Dr. Andrew DeCondo, active vice chancellor of NAST and all the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research who've given us the support to be able to host this series of webinars. I'm particularly delighted to be welcoming the last cohort of speakers who will be introduced to you shortly because in their current topic, looking at community engagement and the role that communities have come to play throughout the pandemic, we will be able to explore further how scholars, how researchers interface with communities, especially in the process of gathering knowledge. This is especially important for us on the African continent where many communities have found that their knowledge, precious or otherwise uh, generated in the communities, tangible and intangible, has oftentimes been lost to unscrupulous researchers who've come, collected knowledge, taken flight, and then produced and packaged as part of their own scholarship. 
It is in this context that I'm very pleased to see eminent scholars amongst this panel who will speak to the subject of how do we engage with communities? What are the ways in which as academics we can begin to do science different, differently? How can we take advantage of the current pandemic to begin to explore how we can generate the kinds of knowledge systems, knowledge resources and knowledge technologies that can ensure that we practice ethical science with integrity. It is my sincere pleasure on behalf of Professor Pamela Maseko to welcome all of you, the speakers, the facilitator, Mr. Lady Mudise, to ensure that we'll have a very lively and engaged debate. As part of the proceedings this afternoon, I'm going to request those who are in audience to please take note that we will request you to mute your mics and video. Should you wish to make any comments, inputs, please use the chat function to post questions and comments. These will be responded to you at the end of the webinar. I'm especially delighted to note that at the end of this entire series, we are able to generate sufficient knowledge or information and data that can not only lead to new questions for research, but hopefully also generate a publication. In this regard, all the presenters have been invited to expand their presentations with the aim of doing a book publication. We're thankful for the support of the research department at Northwest University, especially the mentorship of Professor Nenesi Khabi, who has ensured that throughout these conversations, her department remains available for support. I'm especially also thankful for the support of all those who have behind the scenes made sure that this webinar will be possible. I'm now delighted to welcome Ms. Naledi Mudise, our facilitator, to take you through the introductions of the speakers and also to take you through what should promise to be a very lively webinar. In closing, I can say that we will learn, among other things, how important communities are in responding to pandemics. We learn through the HIV AIDS era that community care and support is critical, but only for nurturing those who are ill, but for ensuring that the community at large can respond. We now have programs, for example, under the UNAs for the care of orphans and vulnerable children. We've seen people live longer and healthier lives because they were given that very important ingredient, love, care, and support. The same also happened during the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. The care of and by people in communities are what will sustain us through this pandemic. I believe that COVID, although it has become a very, very real threat in our livelihoods today, it will be like many others in the past, be defeated and will come through stronger as a global humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thank Professor Sikhoja. Um, I would just like to also welcome all of the panelists that we have with us this evening and the and everybody who has joined us for this very thought-provoking webinar. Um, my role this evening is just to firstly, to everybody who is joining us, um, all the participants, you are please um, encouraged to ask questions as the panelists present. These questions, as Professor Sohoja alluded to, will be responded to at the end of the towards the end of the webinar. Um, my responsibility this evening is just to again introduce the panelists. And the first keynote speaker that we have this evening is Professor Pesi Chimarumbe from, um, who is a professor of biology in the Department of Natural and Applied Sciences at the Namibia University of Science and Technology. His areas of expertise are in conservation, genetics, plant pathology, host microbe, interactions and omic technologies. His current research focuses on the use of biotechnology in the biotechnology in the um, finding solutions to problems in agriculture within the indigenous knowledge research niche area of the Faculty of Health and Applied Sciences. Professor Percy Chumarumbe holds a BSc in biochemistry, MSc biotechnology, and obtained his PhD, PhD genetics degree at 
PhD in genetics degree at the University of Pretoria in South Africa in 2001. He did postdoctoral research in genetic modification of maize for antifungal resistance at the Department of Botany at the University of Pretoria and University of Rome in 2001 to 2002. He graduated in 12 PhD and 12 and 27 MSc students who now are serving the Namibian scientific fraternity in various capacities. He has attracted to Namibia research funding from international and regional agencies, as well as being able, as well as being invited to present scientific papers worldwide. To date, he has published over a hundred peer-reviewed research articles and book chapters. He is a fellow of the Zimbabwean Academy of Science and the Alexandra von Haldemont Foundation. Please welcome him tonight as he gives his presentation on microbiology, indigenous knowledge confluence, the COVID-19 pandemic wake up. Thank you, Prof. Pessy. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me, uh, Ms. Naledi and the organizing team. And I would like to also uh, thank the a participating audience who are participating uh, remotely. Uh, my presentation is going to be uh, talking about um, where indigenous knowledge and microbiology come together. Uh, I, I know I have a long story to share, but um, uh, I will not bother you with a lot of uh, jargon and uh, a lot of uh, uh, confusing uh, 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 grammar stuff regarding my field of genetics and microbiology. What I really would want to share with you is how we have benefited from tapping on what is known by local communities for many years, indigenous knowledge, and how it meets very well with uh, the so-called uh, Eurocentric uh, kind of knowledge in microbiology uh, and exploit what we know are experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic to see if we cannot maybe wake up uh, and start doing things slightly differently because over the years we have really started from uh, doing things in a way in which we eventually don't get anywhere far. Uh, so I will in my presentation, take you through uh, some of the work we have done in our laboratories using a very basic, simple example of tapping into indigenous knowledge, uh, actually tapping into wise, what people would call wise sayings of Africa, uh, and using a Namibian example, which we, we tapped on and, uh, and then show you how things have gone on to, to generate very interesting results. Um, and uh, But now, because we are talking about COVID-19, I want to just simply uh, start off by uh, just telling you what you already know, basically, that this pandemic has really caused a lot of problems, uh, be it health-wise or economy-wise, and uh, many other emotional uh, problems that have been caused by this invisible virus. Uh, now, what I need us to understand is so far, many people are running up and down trying to look for a vaccine uh, or rather to look for a methodology that goes through vaccination to treat those that are in trouble. And now the question that I'm always asking myself is, you, you read all over the place uh, that so-and-so has come up with a vaccine, so-and-so has come up with a treatment and so on. And uh, the question is, who is really uh, coming up with the correct, safe remedies? Uh, so far, my own simple observation is from November last year, when this thing started hitting us all over, I realized that uh, there is a very uh, disturbing tendency that whatever that seems to emerge from our continent here in Africa seems to be thrown into the back burner. So I want to apologize Afra, or rather maybe not apologize to say what I will say may trigger some uh, uh, unhappy emotions in people, but uh, I'm asking questions to say maybe 
we have now reached the time because of this COVID pandemic and many other scenarios that present themselves to Africa, it's time that we begin to at least temper science or temper knowledge with some bit of Afrocentric intellectualism. Now, so far, we have had people report many different kinds of plants that can give a, a remedy to viral flus from the Madagascan tea, Artemisia, Anua, where people take and indeed get uh, uh, some relief. Uh, Tylozima isculandum, which is a good source of zinc, uh, which helps in boosting immune systems. And this is uh, the plan which I've been doing some lots of work in the past. And I'll share with you a little bit more on it going forward. And the list of plants that people have been using is quite long. The last one there on the list is Lipia javanica, uh, which is known as Zumbani in Shona language in Zimbabwe. It has helped a lot of people to recover from uh, these symptoms of COVID-19 without necessarily going to hospitals. Uh, but I can tell you without a doubt, uh, none of these have seen day and light in terms of being accepted in conventional medicine. And uh, allow me, before I proceed further, to just take a, 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 a sentence to say, this COVID-19 is really a wake up call to our political prefects who, who run our, our governments that it's high time they begin to listen to what emerges from our continent here and uh, give it a chance at least at, at the bare minimum. Uh, let me talk about indigenous knowledge, just define it. I know all of us, we are aware that uh, indigenous knowledge is basically a set of accumulated knowledge and practices uh, that has been kept by communities over long periods of time, helping them to survive their own environments. And uh, it is from this that we, are beginning to tap on them and to avoid exploitation of those knowledge holders, uh, at least to derive some benefits. Different countries have set up a legislature to try and protect them. And here in Namibia, in 2017, we managed to enact a, a law called Access to Biological and Genetic Resources and Associated Traditional Knowledge Act number 17. Basically, setting it up in order to regulate how genetic resources of the country are accessed and exploited in a sustainable manner and as well ensuring benefits sharing which is equitable uh, between the innovators and also knowledge holders. Uh, I wanted to share this slide just to show how use of uh, traditional knowledge has led to uh, Dr. Sondash from Zambia to be allowed to treat patients of AIDS uh, we using the Sondash Formula 2000. I believe this is not only happening in Zambia, but in, in many parts of Africa, and we need to see more. Uh, we need this space to be opened up a bit better to allow our traditional knowledge or our indigenous knowledge, uh, so to speak, to be exploited to the fullest. Uh, without necessarily listening to voices from elsewhere, where we are always questioned three, four times whether we are doing things correctly. We now understand how things should be done and we should be allowed to do it. Uh, like I said earlier on, the work I've been doing was catalyzed by listening to wise sayings of Africa. And uh, I, want, I don't want to read all of the sayings, uh, maybe two, the last one, number six there which says when the sun is up, people talk. This is uh, the Buja people from Zimbabwe and the portions of Mozambique. They simply want to uh, encourage each other that don't bother too much about what people say. You may hear a lot of discouragements. Focus on what you want to do. And then the one which has really taken me uh, by big interest is the one highlighted in yellow there. When you see Marama being re-sprout, uh, that is uh, a, sig a, a signature to say it is going to rain sufficiently. So this is a plant, Morama bean, and when it re-sprouts, it is telling you that there is going to be enough rain. So you don't need a weatherman to tell you there is enough rain. 
when you simply see the plant re-sprouting, it's a signature that there's going to be enough rain. Now, we started generating a lot of questions about it. There are some pictorials of this plant. It's a creeping plant, very, uh, very rich uh, seeds with nutrients, their proteins and good minerals, very big roots uh, that can be as big as uh, 200 kgs or even beyond. So this plant is what I'll talk about and what we have done on it, uh, but all of it emanating from the curiosity generated from why does it re-sprout uh, when only there's going to be enough rain? Uh, now the question is, uh, so far the plant grows in South Africa, Northern South Africa, North, Northern parts of South Africa, Eastern parts of uh, Namibia and also the Western parts of Botswana. Uh, this plant has been used for many years by the Sun people. And now it's a household plant among other communities that live uh, in and around or within the vicinity of the Sun people. And a lot of our work that we've been doing is around trying to make it a plant which we, we can cultivate. Uh, that slide is just showing some of the work we planned out to do almost 15 years ago in terms of domesticating it. And today I'll share with you just a little bit of the work around biofertilizers, what we started doing around biofertilizers. This plant, uh, it has many products that you can make from it, from oil, uh, high quality oil, uh, yogurts, milk, snacks, uh, basically I can say anything that you can make with a bean, for example, soybean, you can also do with it. Uh, so far, because we don't have enough of the resource, we have not put a lot of our energy in making these products. Uh, what we have put energy so far is to just I try to ask which microorganisms live together with it to enable it to survive dry conditions and also grow very well in poor conditions. Because we knew if we had an answer to that, we may have a handle to making biofertilizers. So we targeted all the microorganisms that have to do something with the biological nitrogen fixation. Because we know nitrogen fixation, if we can uh, temper it properly, we'll be able to make fertilizers that are better than or equal to chemical fertilizers. Chemical fertilizers are not so good because they tend to cause to lend degradation over time. So the only way out is to introduce biofertilizers. Now, taking forward, we, we did all the necessary science, uh, different kinds of experiments. And at the end of it all, we were able to, to establish farms where we do our tests to see, uh, to test the concept, and also uh, to, to plow and to try out uh, different kinds of biofertilizers. And as I speak now, we have discovered a number of new bacteria, uh, 13 of them, that uh, 12 of them are new, which are, we are still trying to get more information to, to prove that they are new bacteria. They have not been known. And uh, a lot of them with the plant growth promoting characteristics. And uh, we are still going on further to answer different questions on how is the flowering of this plant coordinated why does it have such high nitrogen? Are bacteria involved in this? How about the seed flavor? Are bacteria involved in all this? So we, we're still going on with our work to, to justify why this plant is such a miraculous plant. Uh, some of the answers, we have them already. And uh, we have already gone on to do trials of our fertilizers to see if they can enhance production of uh, Cowpeas. We have tested six varieties of cowpeas, and our first results, in fact, we're going to try one, two, and three. And all of them continue to show us that the fields which we treat with the biofertilizers emerging from marama bean can make you harvest double up than when you don't use the fertilizer at all. So we are very excited with this result, and we have now gone on a step further to try and look for partners who can work with us and give them a license 
to mass produce this fertilizer uh, and be able to distribute to communities. And of course, in that process, we are also asking ourselves when this becomes a profitable venture, who is going to be benefiting? Of course, the some people have to be there. What are the percentages and so on? And what does the university get? These are all interesting questions which we are busy dealing with at the moment. And uh, I want to conclude by saying, yeah, it is possible to use indigenous knowledge to be able to gain and understand interactions going on uh, between us and their uh, and microorganisms. And indeed, uh, I am fully convinced that indigenous knowledge is a big role to play in COVID-19 treatment. We need to give it a try and not just ignore it. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I also want to conclude by thanking a number of people and organizations we have worked with over the years to really uh, develop something nice from indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Percy Chimarumbe. Um, I would just like to um, now introduce the second speaker, who is um, Professor and Dr. Muteo Koitiwe from the Northwest University. He will be speaking to us on Bulepa, Dinaledi, and the COVID-19 um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Just to read his profile quickly. Dr. Mutau Koitiwe is the acting director at the IKS Center Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at the Northwest University. He is a lecturer, researcher, and supervisor of the IKS postgraduate students. He was the first coordinator of the Bachelor of Indigenous Knowledge Systems, which is a four-year professional degree registered with the South African Qualifications Authority and approved by the Council of Higher Education. He has been doing indigenous knowledge research with indigenous astronomy experts, African traditional healers, African traditional leaders, researchers, scientists, and various government departments as one of the, as one of the strategies to promote African indigenous knowledge systems. Dr. Koitziwe has published in accredited journals, attended national and international conferences, and he is also a task team member of the recognition of prior learning of indigenous knowledge. His current focus is on developing a cadre of IKS ambassadors and institutionalization of IKS at the Northwest University. We welcome you, Dr. Mutal. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, on this webinar series. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I will quickly like to do my short introduction by reading from um, uh, the book written by Zulu Shaman, Busama uh, Zulu Credo. It's called Zulu Shaman Prophecies, Dreams, um, and Mysteries. Uh, I'm going to read from chapter five, which uh, talks about the Song of the Stars. Uh, Baba Credo Mutwa, he says, the song of the stars is truly the song of Africa. For you will find legends and law, laws about the sun and the moon and all the stars throughout this vast continent. And the mythology and even the histories of our people are fully of description, not only on the stars and planets, but of the intelligent beings that belong to them and how they have interacted with the human beings. Uh, colleagues, uh, you can hear from what Baba Credo Muto has just said here, that as Africans, uh, we do have a very rich knowledge of what we call uh, the knowledge of the cosmos and the stars, uh, the moon, the sun, and other constellations. So colleagues, um, I'm going to give a very short presentation around what I call Volepa Dinaledi and COVID-19. Uh, I will explain what is Bolipalina Lady along the way, but in short, Bolipalina Lady in English uh, is a term that I coined uh, myself when I was doing my doctoral studies uh, in uh, African indigenous astronomy. So I called this uh, African indigenous astronomy uh, Bolipalina Lady. So, colleagues, if you can see, I just provided a very 
interesting map. There is an old map uh, that shows um, how our continent has been uh, structured, especially in terms of uh, where we belong. Uh, I come from South Africa and uh, I used to do uh, my research on African indigenous astronomy or Bolipadinality among uh, the Botswana in South Africa, especially Bakata Bakakafela in Muruleng and the Batago in Magiskral. I also did some research around Bolipadinality uh, in Botswana uh, among the Bakata Bakakafela in Muchudi. And I also used to do some work uh, in Namibia among the Botswana because, as you know, also in Namibia, we also have the Botswana there uh, in, I think, in Hobabis. Uh, I used to go to a village called Epukiro. Uh, so, colleagues, uh, this is where uh, my presentation is based. It's based around my uh, more than 10 years of research of working around um, uh, the disciplines of competency on African uh, indigenous astronomy. So uh, I would also like to say colleagues, um, just in few words, if you have, uh, you know, the scholar called uh, by the name of Edward Said, who have written a book called Orientalism. Uh, in that book, um, he's trying to show us how dangerous sometimes research can be. He says, uh, and I call also from one of the knowledge holders by the name of Professor Ngondo, who says research, especially in Africa and Asia, has, has always not began with the life experiences, the knowledges, the insights, and the philosophies of the people. It always began with um, the experiences, the philosophies, and the norms of Europe. So what we are saying here in Baha'i too is that um, what uh, Edward Said is saying is that um, what we know now as Africa and Asia is merely a projection of Western desires on both Africa and Asia. So what we are trying to say here, colleagues, is that let us try by all the means to make sure that uh, we promote our own knowledge systems using our own uh, ideas and also our own ways of living. So uh, as I go back to my slides quickly, uh, I'm going to show you here, as you can see, it is a picture of the elders uh, in Botswana, in the traditional uh, authority setting. Because if you are doing community engagement or any research, your first point of entry will be the traditional leaders who are also a discipline of competency. Because in IKS, uh, especially during this COVID-19, most of the people who have been talking about IKS have only been focusing on one discipline of competency which is the traditional health practitioners who work with African traditional medicine, like Artemisia, Lengana, and all the stuff. But in IKS, we've got about more than 15 disciplines of competency. It includes traditional leaders. It can include also um, African indigenous experts, or what I call Baitiana Beba Bolepadina Lady. So if you are doing your community engagement, you have to engage with the elders and uh, so that they can always give you the permission because they are the custodians of the, the knowledge that we are dealing with, which is a community knowledge. So I used to do that in Botswana, in South Africa, and also in Namibia. These are the elders in Botswana who are in charge of uh, Muchudi, which have got more than about uh, five clans of Bakata Bakafela, which are uh, Manamakoteng and other, other, other clans which are very important among the Botswana. So this is a picture of the um, traditional leaders uh, in uh, Namibia there, in a place called Ekupiro, like as I said, and other tribal lands of Botswana in those areas, like as we said, Botswana in Namibia, uh, Botswana, and also in South Africa. And also, as you can see here, uh, we do this research or this community engagement with Baitiana, Ba, or those that I call the indigenous astronomy experts. And uh, they vary from different angles. And as you can see, this picture is a picture of one of the elders in Muruleng. He is a traditional health practitioner. And uh, before we do everything with these people, we give them um, uh, consent forms and uh, we explain everything to them. So whatever that we do with them is legal because what is very important in research is also the question of benefit 
uh, of what are is that the, the communities or the knowledge holders or what the other people call organic intellectuals will benefit from our research. So I'll quickly move around these uh, pictures or these um, photos. As we can see, this is one of the old uh, indigenous knowledge astronomy expert um, in Namibia. So I engage a lot with these people. Uh, these ones, they are the ones, the elders we find in Muruleng among the Baka Tabaka Kafela, who also have a totem called Kabu. And uh, I also have engagement with the elders, uh, the disciplines of, com of competence of the, uh, the people who have knowledge about indigenous astronomy in Muchudi. As we can see also, these are the elders who knows poems, who know stories and songs about indigenous uh, astronomy. So uh, if you can see here, this is what I call my TISO, because if we talk about stars, we can only see stars uh, during the night, most of them. But it doesn't mean that stars cannot be seen during the day, but we can't see them during the day because of uh, the sun, but it doesn't mean that they are not there, but they are there. So if we talk about African indigenous astronomy or Bolipadina lady, uh, as I also myself as a young boy, when I grew up, I grew up with my grandmother around the fireplace where she used to teach us songs, stories, uh, riddles, and poems about Bolipadina lady. So I also do that when I'm engaging with elders uh, because they are the ones who have this knowledge. So we set up this Bolipadina lady, uh, my tea, so our Bolipadina lady, which we sit around the evening fire. And uh, we look at the stars using the naked eye because that's the only technology that the people in the communities have. And we identify the stars according to their names and according to their significance. And uh, this is very important. It's one of the, the sessions that I actually enjoyed. And also, as we can see here, I only not work with the elders, but I also work with the young generations. These are some of the youth that I used to work with uh, in Muchudi. I, I identify them through the traditional leadership and also through the people who assisted me at the Putadigogo Museum, which is one of the community cultural museums of Bakatlava Kapela in Muchudi. And uh, as we can see here, uh, is what they call uh, Sidibelo. A choir ground, or what they call in Botswana, Gego Mabolailo. This is a place where all the choir in Botswana, or what we call the indigenous choir groups, they meet, especially in December, and they come and sing songs about different aspects of Bakata. And they also Bakamata, come. Tell, you have one minute left. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so we have also uh, these uh, ladies, like as I told you, who sit around. Um, the, the, the place to come and sing the songs about uh, astronomy. And we also have learners in schools that we teach them about this at the university about this knowledge. And we also have a uh, link with uh, other departments like science and technology. Like, so as I said, is about the science and the philosophies and the, the cosmology of Botswana. Uh, so it's a very important knowledge. And if I want to go quickly, uh, towards what I call COVID-19 and um, uh, the hardware project that have been established in South Africa and, and the entire world. We realized that most of the projects in astronomy, especially from the astronomy community, they were only related to what we call the issues of the coming up with the ideas around the ventilators. So if we have to engage African astronomy and the East expert, we need to uh, find other ways of how we can be able to bring the knowledge holders on board so that they can be able to deal with issues of COVID-19. So quickly, Wahai, so I would like to go into my conclusion. Uh, i like to say that um, uh, the polybinality potential responses to COVID-19 will include the sharing of knowledge, data, and to promote collaborative research and also innovative ways and to develop disciplines of competency in African astronomy, and also to mobilize a recognition of prior learning for indigenous astronomy aspects. So in conclusion, colleagues, I would like to say that Bolipadina lady is grounded in Ubuntu. So uh, we need to not use our ideas and science and technology uh, to uh, deepen uh, what we call uh, inequalities. We need to use Ubuntu uh, to shape our research and community engagement agenda. 
In the final analysis, I would like to say, colleagues, let us use our language and our oral traditions to promote uh, bolivarinality among our communities and also as a respond during and also beyond COVID-19. Thank you very much, uh, Mena Lady, for your time and the colleagues. Thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Motel. Um, I just want to say, of course, every time I hear the word Naledi, my, my mind peaks. I, I pay closer attention. So I found that to be a very engaging um, presentation. Um, let me just now present our third keynote speaker, who is Professor Bonani Nentendama. Professor Bonani Nentendama is a trained mental health nurse at the, and the first director of community engagement at the University of Venda. Since 2009, she has facilitated community engagement, policy, and strategy. She has initiated and nurtured several community engagement in indigenous knowledge systems research and advocacy program, and has been instrumental is in several research collaborations, including international, including that of an international nature. Her current focus is on developing the capacity for community engagement scholarship. And, education, and educational experience for undergraduate students. Professor Bonani Nentendaba is the 2016 award alumina of the Department of Science and Technology Distinguished Women in Science. She has graduated more than 15 PhDs and 26 master's students. Professor Bonani Nentendaba tonight will be talking to us about community engagement in higher education as a discursive space of organic intellectuals, the academic bourgeois and communities. Thank you so much, Professor Bonani. Over to you. Um, thank you. I really want to start by appreciating the opportunity to uh, reflect on the work that I did um, many years ago uh, from 2010 to be exact with uh, uh, Professor Matoma Holu on, um, <laughs> and it was really a, a journey that started because of questioning when we felt um, kind of somewhat out of place at, at that time as, as, you know, as, as academics and me being um, also naive and inexperienced. Uh, we wanted to find something that would um, probably explain better how we relate with all of this. The ambition on one hand to be this academic or this professor and the inward unsettling experiences of, um, you know, wanting to make a difference. In, in, in what one was doing at that time. So we, I'm going to share a bit about the organic intellectual, how we understood it and how, I mean, the contestations, of course, um, you will see that I have extracted some of the arguments that we, um, we made then and we're still making now. And really my purpose uh, also to show the difficulties of having to navigate in this kind of spaces um, and still be counted. And I hope um, that it will also be talking to, you know, the young ones who are uh, listening today, uh, what it will take for them to be, um, you know, the kind of professors that are presenting today. Uh, hoping that it will also stimulate the, uh, the discussion among them. So quickly, I'm going to just um, say that we did review uh, the Gramscian notion of organic intellectual, and we discussed it then, and I've just extracted um, this to say that we, we then re phrase it in a way that doesn't only talk to the person but to the place and I'm sure as I, 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 I continue it will it would be clear why um, so I mean as I indicated from the the narrative and the research that has been done from his um, prison notes and those who 
who know uh, his work would know, um, you know, how it has evolved and so forth. We found that this was a home for us to explain some of the things that we are doing uh, in a way that uh, we can still um, navigate um, the space. And um, we also um, understood that um, we would have to infuse it with what we were experiencing. Uh, this slide that is on at the moment, it's showing the, you know, the, the, the original description or definition um, according to Gramsci uh, and indicating those kind of academics or intellectuals um, that were also activists or uh, in, in, in today's time, they would probably uh, be part of the movements uh, or labor movements and so forth, or they could be supervisors and so forth. And, and, and that, and, 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 and the, tra oops, against the traditional one of the professor who, or the academic who would be maintaining the status quo, counting the numbers and uh, uh, perpetuating the inequalities. And so um, I, if I may, I would relate it to what has happened to us uh, recently uh, when um, we all know as researchers and as academics how we all ran into you know, counting the numbers of publication output. Uh, you know, and and, and I'm, I'm glad that we are going past that period um, um, at the moment where we are beginning to also, again, reflect as reflective practitioners. Wait a minute. Um, what are we doing? What are we doing as particularly also from people of the native origin with so many problems? So we know that it is going to be continuing to be an unsettling identity. You are going to also feel um, um, out of place or not fitting or not assimilating well. Uh, however, as, 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 as I would argue later, uh, it is also about having a stance, um, um, a place where I'm glad the two speakers have already indicated how it looks like to navigate or to engage in the space where knowledge is not only codified in terms of what um, the universities say, but it becomes the innovative space of knowledge co-production. Co so the, this person, this intellectual job or um, uh, convictions are such that it, um, they will always be um, um, performing or working in the spaces which are unpopular or which are not regarded as this space as the two, two speakers have um, indicated. And also there is a level of activism and defiance and so forth that I've spoken about. But then the next uh, uh, important aspect, which is still relevant today and in the context of what we are saying, in what was said in the to um, uh, presentation. Um, we, I extracted this because I wanted to show that it's probably also true today that we would have to redefine um, and create new definitions because as it was uh, originally understood, the binaries, it's clear that the binaries would have to be uh, uh, avoided. It's not always going to work if we are to be practical today that you only would have to be loud and uh, be known as this one who doesn't 
agree all the time. If I boil it down to meetings of the university higher degrees committees or the um, ethical uh, uh, ethics committee, um, the argument that we were making here was that sometimes it might need that we stay there longer, which means as I will indicate it, we figure out a way of safely infusing the new ways of working, like obviously what scholars are doing now, the two presentation, and be in the space where you can make a difference. And that's the whole point of, of this discussion. And also, as an educator, as a maker of knowledge at the boundary where there is some level or some stance about what good knowledge or good knowledge production process should look like, which leads us to then engagement space, which I've been um, navigating for the past um, 10, 10, 15 years. And so these definitions are what you will see um, mostly in literature. I'm not going to bother uh, you about, but I'm, 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 I'm also going to um, argue that the reason why there is a link between being that person who's organic and is principled and is, has interest unapologetically so to redress certain injustices that happened. Why community engagement is a good and noble idea structurally, systematically, and otherwise that university should be having at the moment. Um, I, I have to say that because there is still a struggle um, to, to, whereas the policies are saying, yeah, it is an important function of a university academic, it is still a distant other, which is not resourced properly, which is also uh, receiving all sorts of arguments about, oh, it is not strong knowledge, uh, and so forth and so forth. And so I argue therefore that uh, we need to uh, join hands and be rigorous about you know, showcasing, for example, some of the work that uh, has been showcased now. So in the interest of time, I won't uh, 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 go into details in all of that. I, I'm just uh, putting out there a principle that we can negotiate. Uh, and the methodologies uh, or the methodological framework uh, have been articulated well these days. The literature is really uh, rich in those and the arguments are good. So it's, it's not all doom and gloom. It is such that if we um, consistently develop these communities of practice and begin to work the way we, are, we, we have seen the two senior colleagues uh, working in their presentation, then we would be going to the right direction. But I also want to argue before I stop that the positioning of this period of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is such that it can also be dangerous. Uh, it can also um, be uh, making us feel out of place. For argument's sake, let me just say that we are at a point where we are now engaging through uh, uh, technology, well and good, but an organic intellectual would be humble enough to still question the accessibility of this kind of technology to the marginalized community. 
and question, what are we doing about it? What, what must we do? And be okay with the notion of, I don't know, let's figure it out, which I sometimes feel um, with regard to how then am I going to reach out to my uh, reference group of traditional uh, healers, for example, who are not connected? I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult as it is for universities to even connect all the students and all the, I mean, the, 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 the academics and administrators. Um, so is it not going to perpetuate uh, the us and them and dominant paradigm and if it should or should not what should organic intellectuals be doing out there in the community also and of course um the 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 inputs that that about the um alternative medicine and so forth it, it, it's it's uh, i mean it's one that i i am particularly interested in but the question still remains, you know, uh, what else is out there um, that we are missing? What if we got it all wrong? What is it that we should be challenging in the current strength, uh, uh, trends? Um, and with that, it's a difficult question that, um, uh, perhaps all I can just do uh, out of humility is to um, say, let's figure it out, let's balance it out. And I want to also um, end up with a word of encouragement to the youngest uh, generation, new generation of academics. I listened when my two colleagues uh, who presented before me were saying how passionate they are about capacity building uh, and making sure that the new generation of African academics um, uh, value the wisdom that is out there and the wisdom that comes with experience and, and, and so forth and so forth. And therefore, uh, I'm looking up to uh, colleagues, of course, and but of younger generation to come up with models where we could employ these blended mentorship programs uh, uh, and, and appreciate practically. Because my argument is that whilst we are going there, we are not there yet. This, the, the academic project is still very much controlled by the bourgeois mentality. And therefore, there is a need for for us to continue to reflect on that and figure it out. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Nintendama, for that incredible presentation. I think it's a key takeaway for us all, especially the younger academics, especially when you're talking about reimagining ideas of identity and who we could potentially be in the academic in the academic space as new generations and also adding on um, new knowledge from indigenous knowledge systems. Thank you so much for your presentation. I would like to welcome now our final keynote speaker, Ms. Muronga Masemola. Ms. Muronga Masemola is a South African who has worked as an analyst in chemical laboratories and later as a lecturer in two colleges of education in South Africa. The last two decades were spent in a subject advisory on physical sciences and in the monitoring of curriculum in the National Department of Basic Education. It is during her tenure in these positions that questions about what Africans knew and, know, and how organizations of such knowledge can and should be used to support their daily needs and decision-making. She's currently pursuing her D.Ed. with UNISA, and she will be talking to us this evening about indigenous knowledge systems in 2020, provisions, omissions, and its impact on grassroots innovations. To you, Ms. Moronga. Thank you very Thank much. You very much.
We're trying to. We can hear you. There's just a bit of feedback. Yeah, it's actually a lot. Just a little bit trying to. Because the. Okay, maybe it's 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 Hello. Hello. Paul, is there anything that you can help? Okay. 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 Mm. Mm. Is it okay now? No, we're still having feedback. Can you try again? Ms. Moronga, are you still there? I think we have lost Ms. Moronga Masamola. Um, in the meantime, I would just like to encourage all of our participants to please continue asking the questions um, through the Q&A button. I will ask the questions and there will be a session for engagement um, as soon as Ms. Masemola completes her presentation. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost Miss um, Masimola, and it's really, really unfortunate. I was really interested to, you know, maybe the question and answers on what Africans knew and how that could be used and used at grassroots levels. However, we do have a few questions here for Prof. Pesi. Um, I noticed that Prof. Pesi had answered in the Q&A button, but I would just like for him to please expand on that for us, for other panelists who are joining us, or for other attendees who are joining us this evening. Leonard Mamba from Univen had asked about, had asked Prof. Pesi, what are you saying about the Madagascar in, Madagascan indigenous knowledge practice since they were regarded not safe by the World Health Organization? He asked a few questions, so I'm just going to read them all. And Prof. Percy, I hope that you can reflect on these questions um, um, after. Okay. Am I am I off completely now? No, we can hear you now. You're much better. Are we? I think you can proceed at this point. Um, the okay. question and answer will come after your presentation. We apologize okay. for the confusion, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Masimura. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm so sorry about this technology. Um. My presentation, as I said, is a persuasive presentation. It's, it's more of um, a request to teachers, writers of material, designers of curriculum, especially in South Africa. I'm not too sure about what happens in Namibia. But the reason why I would like us to listen to this persuasion is that if we keep on having these conferences and the average learner who is going to become a lecturer at some point, does not know or believe in indigenous knowledge systems, we will not win this war. And then you cannot really talk about grassroots and innovation until you delve into the idea of indigenous knowledge. You know? And as, as all of you know by now, reading anything on indigenous knowledge is a mammoth task because indigenous knowledge involves everything with different formations of many things. You can't really isolate and become reductionists like in science. So I'd like to move to my ill-fitting theory. The next slides, uh, I call it an, uh, an ill-fitting theory and I'm glad that um, Dr. Kotiswe also mentions the frameworks, the, Euro, the Eurocentric frameworks. He did say that they don't really frame us 
uh, quoting Said, they don't really frame us as we would like to be framed. So uh, that is why I call it an ill-fitting theory. But I think it's a good theory, the knowledge gap theory, which talks about how information cascades to ordinary people. And I don't know if much has changed with the cascading because I don't know if our learners passing through our universities and students uh, have tools to actually cascade knowledge or if the people sitting at home have access to the policies, to what happens, to the laws, etc. And I would like to use it kind of loosely though. We can move on. I will not define indigenous knowledges. I'll, these are my favorite definitions, but I've had uh, Professor Chena Murubi also had uh, his own definitions, but more or less they say the same thing, but accepting that, you know, which is typical of indigenousness, that things can be said differently. And uh, there's really no, not one meaning prescribed to everything specific. People are allowed the freedom to express and see things differently. I'll now go to this explanation on grassroots, et cetera, modern science and explain what uh, I, I would like to, 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 dive, to, to share with you. Uh, grassroots innovation, as the name suggests, lie within mainstream non-scientific communities who rely on indigenous knowledge system for many aspects of their lives. Now, this is ve it's very important to note that Although this definition says they rely, they lie uh, within non-scientific communities, the word scientific here is a bit of a misnomer because, you know, the, it seems to suggest that indigenous people know nothing about science. And I would like to say that is not true. Indigenous people know about science just as much as the average person except the terminologies and the laws that were created from models. Because they, remember that science, where it started, it was describing nature. So all those people that we talk about never call themselves scientists. They were just natural philosophers, just like our indigenous uh, people. So we must be very careful of thinking that indigenous people don't know science because we've, we've packaged it in extreme language. If you think about the first law of dynamics, uh, thermodynamics, for example, about where heat travels, everybody knows that, you know. If you think about the laws of Newtonian mechanics, what we call Newtonian mechanics, are actually laws of nature. People know all those three laws. They don't just say them the way we say them in a prose form. So I like to really look at them as natural uh, philosophers and um, incorporate science in that definition. Now, we can, we can never talk about development in Africa without tying development to innovation. Everything that brings development is tied to innovation. And um, you know, we, we can actually be masters of our own innovation in Africa. I know there's this, uh, the industrial revolution, you know, we've got the first, the second and the third, and you have actually those less than a hundred countries that determine the direction of all the, the four revolutions that we've experienced so far, which is a pity. But for us to really understand the definition, um, we need to also listen to the critiques on, on, on what development has done in Africa. Development, uh, Holland Rosenberg says that it has come at high cost in human, ecological, health, economic, political, and social terms. And I think we can all agree we know what happens in, even, even here in our own country. Uh, if we look around the mining areas, you know what happens to the water systems, animals dying. We think about we can say in, in Uganda. We, but, but it's not even our, our, our development that we are catering in our countries that does this. We have indigenous communities, a very high number of them who don't have a voice, who don't even know if the policies in our countries uh, support them. And uh, Shibanda also thinks that the Western development models of de uh, they've dealing to the African indigenous knowledge systems from development itself, leading to development without grassroots participation. You've seen people in the Eastern Cape fighting for, for, for the mining in their areas, talking about how, how development actually impacts on their livelihoods. I think uh, advocates, um, um, 
um, uh, this, uh, I'll remember, <laughs> I didn't write it down. Okay. So it does seem that the type of development that we are is also able to reduce whole communities to consumers. We have development, lots of development. There are indexes that tell us what development is. And then we also have, we also have communities that used to farm. Now they have no land to farm. People that used to grow uh, 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 cotton long time ago with the second uh, uh, um, development that the world development that happened, the synthesis that changed uh, materials to plastic, whole cotton farmers in Africa, you know, lost. I know because my grandmother was a cotton farmer, but now with the, with the, with the industrial development that took place when we discovered synthesis in China and all those old Silk Road places discovered how to turn everything into plastic. Those farmers were left, um, you know, were, were left very stranded and they became very poor. But what development has really done really is to make us employment seekers. I think we all know people in our families. When we talk to one another, we talk about people are not employed, people are looking for jobs, blah, blah, blah. Now, the title was talking about the provisions. The provisions to look at this have been made, not only in South Africa. They started with the Organization of African Union long before the African Union came into place. If you also read the papers of that time, the archives, if you can access those archives, you will find that we are actually just going about the same thing. And we have these world bodies, even in Africa, that really don't read the documents. You know, people just go there to meet and not really interrogate what was written in policies. We have in South Africa, the constitution that calls for indigenous knowledge systems. We have our education is framed by the white paper on education and training of 1995, which really calls on African knowledges. The indigenous knowledge systems policy of 2004. And in our curricula in schools, we have the natural curriculum statements. Now we have lecturers at universities who are running courses, designing courses and writing courses. And I've, I've, I haven't seen all of them, but the few that I've seen seem to neglect chapter one, which for me captures the national qualifications framework. It captures the, 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 the white paper. It captures the constitution even. So I would like to just read a few things on what the white paper says. Um, Ms. Murunga, you've got two hello? minutes. Oh, two minutes okay. left. All right. I'm going to ask people to read the white paper and the, I, all these things that I've mentioned, and also to pay attention to um, what knowledge is, what knowledge has been de described as, and how the absence of IKS in the curriculum and a lack of innovation on the part of curriculum planners, which happens educates us away from the culture. So we can talk about how to help grassroots innovation, but our curriculum at school does not help them uh, to value it. I also want to talk about uh, the, 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 post, the, the, the power of concepts and the power of words. It's very important that we choose our words that we are using, the concepts that we are using that were designed for us. Choose very carefully what these mean, because what you will find is that a lot of these concepts shift us away from what we are supposed to be saying. Concepts are powerful. They are discourses in themselves. And all these concepts are not by mistake. They were designed in a particular way to send us on a particular uh, channel vision. I'm sorry, I think my presentation was long, but I'm sure you can get the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Ma Samola. Unfortunately, we had that um, you know, technical glitch and that unfortunately ate away at your time, but I was very interested in understanding how IKS can also be added to school curricula because as you were just talking now, that it would now create a sense of ownership from learners or from a very younger age and they would grow with it to come into academia or to come into the university space with that already ingrained um, knowledge within them. Um, just to proceed, we are now at the question and answer session time. 
I would just like to encourage the panelists to please try to be as concise as possible. We do not have that much time left. However, for all the questions that I do not pose at this time, um, we do hope that they will be answered under the YouTube clipping or the YouTube video that will be submitted of this webinar series. So if your question is not answered, please go check out, um, please go look at it under the, on the YouTube page that the university currently has this, um, where it's being hosted. The first question, so I'm just going to ask questions, one question to each colleague, and I hope that they will be as concise as possible. To um, Dr. Motel Koitsiri, um, Professor Alina asked, how do you disseminate your research findings and share those findings with the communities that you work with? Before I proceed, I just want to say, I'll be asking all the panelists all the questions at the same time, so that when we respond, we respond um, one after the other as well. So this question is for Dr. Motel. The, the second question or the question for Professor Nintendama is, how does um, the organic intellectual survive within the bourgeoisie space of academia? And to Ms. Masamola, what is ethics from an IKS perspective? And finally now to Professor Percy, who we began with, what are you saying about the Madagascan indigenous knowledge practice since they are not regarded safe by who? And I think that this question also speaks to the greater dismissal of IKS or indigenous knowledge systems in um, the greater um, academic circles. So what is your opinion on this? Um, I give you, I'll ask Professor Percy or the speakers to respond in their order of, um, in the order that they were speaking as we started. Thank you. Yes. What is ethics from IKS point of view? I don't know. Very much. I don't know. Uh, Ms. Modisa, can I can I take the floor now? Yes, Professor Percy, to you. Thank you. Yes, if I understood the question well, is talking about um, the Madagascan tea. But what do we do now that it has been, or rather, uh, since WHO has said it is not uh, safe? Uh, so I want to start by saying it is very important that uh, while we advocate for uh, Afrocentricism uh, in the practice of science, we, we are not advocating for uh, throwing scientific methods out of the window totally. Rather, we are actually saying, let's use science in a proper way, but let's also be vigilant that we do not allow science to be used against us as well, by way of, uh, you know, by way of uh, just belittling outcomes that may come from an African laboratory or from African experiments, so to speak. Uh, if indeed, the Madagascan tea was shown to be toxic. I would definitely say if the science proves that people die because of it, yeah, sure, let's not go ahead with it. But uh, my question is uh, that has not been shown. What we have heard are pronouncements from WHO uh, where they were, I believe, informed about the scientific processes that were done in Madagascar. And there's a lot of debate around that. And as I speak now, I know the CSIR in South Africa are busy testing out the, uh, the Madagascan tea to see its safety. Uh, what may be interesting for all of us to know is that the Madagascan tea has been taken by the Madagascan people for many, many years. It's not because of COVID that they are taking it. Did I have another question? I believe I did. Um, no, Professor Percy, I just asked that we please respond to one question one. per speaker because we have, yes, unfortunately. Okay, no, that's all right. I, I, I thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would just like to give the floor over to Dr. Koitziwi. Did you get your question, Doc? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mena lady, I think with regard to the question of how do we disseminate 
our research findings in community. I think uh, it's not an easy one uh, because as you know, uh, most of our research that we do from university, uh, the intellectual property rights in many cases lies with the university. And how we do that in university, we have to publish papers and make sure that um, <clears throat> this knowledge maybe is in uh, international journals. But what we do, in local communities in many cases is that, uh, like as Prof. Uh, Nechandame has said, we like to involve our knowledge holders or our communities uh, from the onset in terms of the development of uh, topics that we want to research and also even the research methodologies that we want to use with them so that they become not only the subject of research but they become also the owners and also uh, the core managers of this research. So in terms of uh, how do we share this, this report with them or these findings, I think uh, most importantly, when we do our research, language comes at the center of the research because at the beginning, we must be able to communicate effectively with the local communities during and also at the end of the research. And also uh, the benefits of this research could be either uh, uh, non-monetary because in terms of monetary, it is very difficult for you to provide that uh, benefit to the community. So I think we can share uh, these uh, findings from the community in many ways by either hosting those uh, community-based workshop, like in my case in Muchudi and in uh, Muruleng and other local communities. I also used to uh, identify local uh, young learners there who also are interested in this particular field so that we can either uh, give them some bursaries uh, to study for this indigenous astronomy or this indigenous knowledge systems. And we also host what we call uh, community uh, feedbacks in terms of workshops. Uh, like in this case, we do those MITISO sessions and we provide the feedbacks to the community in terms of whatever that we have find out. And we also host this uh, musical festivals in the communities as a way of engaging our um, as a way of engaging our communities, not only when we do research and also when we live after doing the research, we disappear. So our engagement with the community is a long-term uh, commitment and we try to also establish what we call a reciprocal relationship with this community member so that we don't just only look at them as a subject of research because it's very important for us to come up with uh, the benefits of research in terms of our own communities and how we share this knowledge. So it is not an easy exercise. I know for most researchers, when we do our research after those things, we also disappear. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Menalady, for, for the time. I hope I managed to maybe provide a clarity around that question. I, I believe you did. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mattel. Um, I'm so sorry to rush the remaining speakers. I would just like to give over to uh, Professor Nintendama for your answer. Yes, quickly. How do you survive? You just have to be patient. You just have to be true to yourself. You just have to have a thick skin and balance it out. The whole point about me bringing the issue of balancing out is that you should be tactful when to say, when to act uh, against the prescripts or the systemic oppressive uh, arrangements of these committees. Because if you are too much vocal, as it's suggested, of public intellectual, you may alienate yourself in, to an extent that you won't make impact. So the argument that I was bringing of balancing out is that, lastly to say that fortunately the methodologies that we are advocating for in IKS of partnering reciprocity and so forth, make it such that by the time you finish your project, the communities, the participants at least in that group are already owning the, the, the results and they can also be part of the dissemination to the larger population. Thank you. Sorry, I have to rush it, uh, but that will be the short of it. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that prompt response. Um, let me just give over to uh, Ms. Moronwa to answer. I think let me just change the question quickly and 
it says this question that I think is very interesting is which aspects of IKS do you think ought to be included in the curriculum for the purpose of empowering the African child to craft their country's development path? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. I think that's a good question. Um, you know, if we are going to think in terms of which part to put in the existing structure, then we are really reducing ourselves. We should think about reorganizing and actually forming. And science as a reductionist knowledge can actually be a subset of what you already have. I think we should pay attention to the formations that we find existing in old age, how people in our communities used to organize themselves. We need to replicate those structures and work like that. And all these things that we are doing should actually just form small aspects of the bigger frameworks. But if you, if, if in South Africa, if all the documents had actually guided properly the, on, on, on what needs to happen. So if the white paper actually was very specific on not teaching the way we are teaching. So the guidance is already there, but what I'm saying is the formation that exists or existed before need to be revisited and repackaged. And this is actually how education must take place. I would just like to say thank you. Okay. okay. Did I interrupt? I I, no, 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 no. It's okay. I don't know how much time I do have. I think I, I wanted to share a lot with about concepts, about language. Language is extremely important. So we should first of all start speaking our language, allow our kids to speak the language and learn the language. Because even our language is our knowledge itself. You know, you, you don't even need to learn everything at school. The language itself has knowledge. And then we need to also look at the concepts. We should not move to translation because if you are asking what aspects of IKS are we putting in, it means now we are translating. We're gonna be saying photosynthesis, what can we call it? No, we might not even need to talk about photosynthesis. We might need a very holistic way of looking at plants. So it's a total upside down model that we need to develop together. That's all. Thank you so much. I think that is very fascinating insights. And I do hope that after the webinar, maybe you can provide the rest of the presentation so that once the video is uploaded, we can all be able to engage with your thoughts on that. Um, unfortunately, we have literally run out of time. So I would just like to give over again to Professor Alina Sehodre to please do the vote of thanks. <laughs> Take a look. Good evening again. It's in fact Professor Maseko, Pamela Maseko, who will be doing the vote of thanks and closing. Professor Maseko? In the absence of Professor Maseko, let yes. me take this opportunity, colleagues, thank to you. thank oh, uh, the participants, especially the key speakers who gave us very insightful understandings of the applied science that we have in respect to IKS. Particularly what I found fascinating was uh, Dr. Motoko was. Um, um, insights into what we have traditionally called astronomy in the Western uh, world, but now is being understood in an indigenous vernacular, Lestona uh, be my mother tongue, as Bolibalina lady. Likewise, Professor Shimomorombe's work, which has shown in an era where issues of food security is very critical, how experimenting with what has been seen as a veiled product, in this case, wild food, Morama, can in fact not only foster new insights into sustainable development in respect of reutilization of that product, but also in how that product can begin to um, explore science in different ways. Most of us are familiar with uh, these products and so far as we can eat them as they are, but the capacity of scientists to take them to a step further and ensure that they can be utilized 
in creating new products, in this case, bio products for fertilizers is fascinating bit of research that I think we need to be looking at. I think what has come out from this series of uh, webinars is the fact that there's a diversity and a very rich resource of knowledge and scholarship across the two institutions, just NAST and NWU. I'm hoping that beyond this series, we are able to partner again for not only a similar kind of project, but to hopefully encourage young emerging scholars and established scholars to partner and continue these conversations in their own spaces. I would like to thank very deeply the two universities leaderships for giving us a space and time to be able to undertake this, uh, what I would call applied research through the webinars to interrogate the six topics and pillars that we provide. We would never have had an opportunity to meet if it had not been passed for the lockdowns, which gave us a platform through um, uh, this uh, uh, online platform to communicate, to engage, and to share knowledge. I would like to thank the service provider, New Sounds, which has worked with us from the very beginning of the project in conceptualizing it and ensuring that our technological support was uh, very, very good. And I would like to believe that those who may wish to go back to look at previous uh, webinars have an opportunity to do so online. I would like to thank at Northwest University, the communications team who worked with us around the clock to ensure that not only all the speakers are capacitated to be able to present, but also that the advertising of all of the presentations was done timelessly and to ensure that we are all literally on top form when it comes to the actual delivery. Um, I think uh, many people are aware that uh, this COVID-19 will continue to challenge us into the next year, possibly even beyond, until a cure, a cure is found. Even when the cure is found, it's quite clear that we in the Global South will continue to not have equal in terms of access to the treatment that comes with it. It will, as we have heard, not only be those countries who have resources who will be able to access it, but even in terms of stockpiling. So it is likely we'll be buying these products at a very high price. So it's very important that we can invoke our indigenous knowledge and continue, as Prof. Chimamrombe said, to experiment with African traditional medications to test their efficacy, to ensure that we can foster a love for science for young emerging scholars, and of course, young children, as Memorongwa has said. Let us have transformative curricula that begins to not only question the idea of knowledge and learning as bestowed to us through the Western or other forms of uh, teaching and learning curricula. Let us explore how Africanized, decolonized curricula can begin to be an entryway to making sure that our new ways of learning or new ways of doing science can be valued, can be taken from what has been called the grassroots to commercial levels in similar ways that then we've seen in other traditions like the Eastern traditions of medicine. I would also want to challenge the presenters in the question that has come through from the uh, panel, from the, the, the audience. What are the ethical concerns and considerations we should be taking forward from these lessons about working with communities? And I think leaving it at that, I would like to say we as the, I would say, team behind the scenes who have worked with you and come this journey with you as our audiences are grateful for your time that you've shared with us. And we'd like to continue engaging beyond these platforms and we'll call upon you to not only feel free to email us to communicate with all the speakers separately um, and uh, through our research offices, but also to propose new topics that we can venture into. This partnership between Northwest University and NAST is an ongoing one governed by our memorandum of understanding, which is between the two institutions. We are hopeful that going forward, we should begin when we have lockdown uh, um, uh, lifted, we should begin to see each other in terms of face-to-face -face meetings. But while we still obey or uh, conform to the regulations of lockdown, 
stay at home and being safe, we'll use these platforms to ensure that we engage and unpack knowledge and in many ways contribute to science for the betterment of the social and human sciences. So I thank you very much and we apologize for going a little bit over time, but I believe that many of you have had a very wonderful engagement over the last few weeks. We hope that we will convene again soon to share with you some of the other dimensions of the human and social sciences, and that is the area of the arts. Because as has been said throughout these webinars, language is a very important element of how we convey science. So we're hoping that we can gather artists and practitioners who can, through that medium of communication, share with us their talents, but also insights into how we configure science through an artistic lens. And that is why throughout these webinars, we've tried to also partner with artists to ensure that we can bring to you the idea of not only music, poetry, and other forms of performative uh, uh, performances, but also to foster that understanding that there is room in science for the arts. And I think with that, I'd like to thank you very profusely and thank my co-host, uh, Professor Pamela Maseko, Executive Dean at uh, Northwest University for walking this journey with us. And among others, to thank Dr. Motel Koitziwe from the IKS uh, Center at Northwest University who brought that IKS lens. Last but not least, one of our colleagues from Marisebo University Institute, Dr. Zuluma Tabu Zulu, who also passionately helped us conceptualize and bring all of these uh, issues and, and discussion points to bear in these concepts that we have shared with you. To the speakers of this evening, thank you very much. Continue to do what you do best, that is communicate your science and advocate for Africanity in the way in which we look at knowledge production in the global south. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Good evening, colleagues. Just say a short greeting. Apologies for the. Uh, can you hear me? It's quite. It's apologies for the the miscommunication earlier on. I couldn't come through properly. I think we're just going to end this.